Yeah, okay. Ready? Ready. Ready. Okay. okay, very good. Okay, okay so uh, welcome to today's uh, the last final day of the workshop. Um, we have, we have five, five talks today, today plus some closing uh, remarks, remarks from our provost, Larry Karen, at uh, five o'clock. And uh, at the first session, uh, I'm chairing the first session, and we have two speakers, uh, the first of which is Professor Fabio Nubila, who is an uh, associate professor at EPFL. Uh, Fabio did his PhD also at EPFL and was a postdoc at UT Austin, and uh, he's very well known for the numerical approximation of PDEs, Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo, multi index Monte Carlo, and so on. And that's just among some of the things he's known for. And as soon as we for at this very final technical issue, we, we will we will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, ready now. And so the so and uh, Fabio is going to be speaking on multi-level and hierarchical sampling methods for Bayesian inverse problems. Please take it away. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jay. And uh, uh, thank you all to the organizers for the invitation. It's always nice to be back to Kaust after a few years. <laughs> um, so this, um, uh, today we'll present uh, uh, some work uh, um, on that we did on Bayesian uh, in inverse problems, uh, um, multi-level and hierarchical method for Bayesian inverse problems. Uh, this uh, is mostly the work of uh, my former PhD students, Juan Pablo Madrigal Chanchi, uh, together with uh, Raul, and uh, part of the work was also in collaboration with Jonas Latz. Uh, and this was actually done uh, within the CRG uh, for a project that Raul had a few, a few years ago, and partly also funded by the Swiss uh, Data Science Center. Uh, okay, does this... Uh... Does this switch slides? No, to do it manually. Um, so the motivation. Um, so the, the the framework here is that uh, um, we would like to do some uh, uh, version inversion for complex uh, uh, systems, in particular, the application in this uh, CRG four was in seismic. Um, uh, engineering, so we are looking at uh, a wave seismic uh, wave propagation within the uh, subsurface. Uh, uh, so the forward model would be the elastodynamic equations, uh, uh, where we have uh, some source uh, somewhere due to some uh, fault rupture, and then waves propagate up to the uh, surface, uh, and then the, and those are recorded in few locations on, on the surface. Uh, and uh, ideally, we would like to invert on the properties of the uh, source uh, mechanism, so the source location and uh, this rupture mechanism, and possibly also on the uh, material properties, uh, so the wave speed within the, the soil in the different uh, strata. Uh, we didn't go that far, at least in the project that I'm presenting here, and so this is more methodological, but this was somehow the driving um, uh, application. Uh, and of course, uh, the big challenge is that the uh, forward model here, when we want to simulate the uh, the earthquake uh, uh, in the uh, physical uh, regime, this is a very heavy computation, is even for a single run. Uh, and now we want to do a full uh, uh, Bayesian inversion. So, in principle, is uh, uh, very challenging. Uh, so that's why one has to exploit all possible structure and one. Uh, possible uh, thing you can play with uh, is the level of discretization of the underlying model. So space discretization and, and time discretization. Um, but there are other uh, ways one could uh, let's say, exploit the structure and try to reduce the computational cost. Um, so actually in this talk, I will uh, uh, discuss uh, ways of uh, including or sort of cheaper uh, simulations uh, in the Bayesian framework, uh, 
uh, and as I said, the, the focus is on this uh, in, inversion, mostly for the source location, but also for some material properties. Um, okay, uh, so in particular, we'll present two uh, works that we did uh, that essentially uh, extend or analyze some ideas that were around. Uh, one uh, is a um, quite popular technique is uh, the idea of tempering and parallel tempering. Uh, so we just uh, revisited this idea of parallel tempering, proposing a generalization of the parallel tempering algorithm. Um, the other uh, is uh, the idea of exploiting uh, uh, multiple discretizations of the underlying model and uh, uh, the, the multi-level Markov chain Monte Carlo. Here again, there are several ideas that have been proposed around and AJ has worked a lot on this. Uh, but uh, so what we have uh, done is uh, uh, looking at one particular multi-level Monte Carlo algorithm and try to say something uh, more precise from the theoretical point of view. Um, okay, so this uh, slide was not meant to be there. So, sorry. Uh, it's annoying that I don't have this. Ah, yeah. Is, is there the USB? Uh, <laughs> does someone have? Um, so who was the last speaker? Eric, no, you didn't. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm using my own computer. There was no computer here. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the setting. Uh, I'm just using these slides to introduce the, the notation. So I'm uh, assuming I have a forward uh, model and underlying uh, PDE like the elastodynamic equations. Uh, so uh, U is the solution. In this case, will be the full displacement uh, field and velocity field. Uh, L is the operator like the elastodynamic equations. Uh, and in general, what we are after is some uh, specific uh, quantity of interest that could be the surface acceleration of the area's intensity somewhere on the surface. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe I can. This. Um, uh, so the, um, we look at some quantity of interest and here theta is the par are some parameters that enter in the model. And those are the parameters, of, the parameters we want to uh, invert from the, the measurements. Uh, uh, measurements that uh, I write in this uh, form here. So uh, given a theta, we can solve uh, the full model, compute the solution, evaluate uh, some observable of the solution. This is the operator H, capital H. Typically will be the uh, displacement on some locations on the surface uh, uh, in multiple uh, time. Uh, polluted by some noise. Uh, and then uh, in a Bayesian framework, we treat the parameters as uh, uh, random variables we are, uh, with a prior distribution uh, that I call pi prior. And then we uh, want to investigate the posterior distribution. So the distribution of the data condition uh, or the parameter condition to the data that uh, will be given by the prior multiplied by the distribution of the noise centered in the uh, forecast uh, here for a given theta. Um, so we're, we're interested in exploring the posterior distribution uh, and eventually computing some posterior expectations of so the expectation of the quantity of interest with respect to this uh, distribution condition and on the available uh, information, available data. Um, uh, okay, of course, the, the main point here is that uh, uh, in practice, we cannot solve exactly the underlying model, so we need to use hypothesization. Um, so in practice, we will only access some uh, approximate version of the solution U, so I call U capital L. L denotes uh, some level of discretization. Uh, and uh, of course, this will induce an approximation on the posterior uh, density, which will not be, be the true one, but I call this pi uh, capital L. Um, 
to denote the approximation in the uh, posterior, which comes from the approximation on the forward uh, map. Uh, and then this will also induce an approximation on the expectation that we want to compute. Uh, so instead of computing the true one, we are computing the approximated one where the approximation enters in the distribution uh, and possibly also in the valuation of the quantity itself, if you are discretizing also the calculation of the quantity of interest. Um, okay, so the, somehow the reference uh, uh, algorithm, at least the reference algorithm that I consider in, in, in this talk uh, is uh, the uh, MCMC, so Markov chain Monte Carlo, and in particular the Metropolis Hastings, very popular Metropolis Hastings algorithm. I bet all of you are uh, very familiar with this algorithm, but this, this is a very quick uh, recap. So the idea is to build a, a Markov chain an ergodic Markov chain that has uh, this pi y or pi y l as invariant distribution. Uh, and then uh, we estimate the posterior expectation, the, the posterior mean of the quantity of interest uh, by an ergodic estimator. So by taking the uh, sample average of the evaluations over the chain. And since asymptotically the states are distributed as the right distribution, this will converge to the right uh, value when M goes to infinity. Uh, so in the metropolis hasting, the idea of the metropolis hasting is uh, uh, that we uh, consider an auxiliary uh, density, proposal density, which depends typically on the current state of the chain. Uh, and then the algorithm is very simple. So from the current state, theta i of the chain, we draw from this uh, auxiliary density, this proposal density, uh, and then we run uh, an acceptance rejection on the proposed candidate state Z, where essentially the uh, what we look at is the ratio between the uh, posterior distribution in the candidate versus the posterior distribution in the current state. Uh, so if the proposal this density is symmetric, this ratio is, uh, is just one. So we accept if we go to a better place. And uh, if we are going to a worse place, we uh, accept only with this, this probability here. Uh, now, if the proposal, uh, uh, if this kernel is not symmetric, you have to correct with this ratio between the kernel of going from the new to the old versus the kernel going from the old to the new. Um, okay, so that's just the metropolis asking. Um, and of course, uh, uh, every time you uh, do this step here, you have to evaluate the posterior, and to evaluate the posterior implies uh, evaluate the solve the full uh, system. So the cost is uh, very high in each step. So the question is, how can we exploit uh, simplified versions of this posterior to accelerate uh, the computation? Um, okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, I present two, two works, one in the direction of tempering and the other in the direction of multi-levels. Uh, so in the tempering, the idea is to, um, so in both cases, the idea is to construct a sequence of uh, posteriors. So the final pi capital L is the one uh, we want to use, the, the good one, let's say still approximate, but we believe that approximation is good enough. Um, but then we want to construct uh, 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 easier versions of this one to use uh, in the algorithm. So one way to construct easier versions is to do tempering. I will give the formula in a minute, so, but the idea is to, uh, this is typical in the case where the posterior, for instance, is highly concentrated on some regions or uh, has mul is multimodal. So this is a typical case where this algorithm suffers because uh, uh, it does little moves uh, but if my if I am on this uh, uh, point here and I move uh, in the red zone where the density is almost zero, uh, this will be rejected. Okay, so I'm obliged to move just uh, do very very little moves to make sure that sometimes I fall again in this interesting region and I uh, move along this uh, narrow manifold. Um, so one way of simplifying the, or making the problem easier is to widen this distribution. So create uh, versions where this uh, uh, little band is, is widened. Uh, and then the metropolis hasting algorithm will uh, run much easier because then you can explore much faster this, uh, this region here and this region here. Uh, and then you want to use this uh, 
easier versions to accelerate the MCMC in the final level. Uh, the other uh, idea is to use, as I said, multi levels, so multiple discretization. So, again, I want to ideally I want to run my MCMC on this uh, fine discretization level here, but I want to use possibly coarser discretization to speed up the, the computations. Uh, okay, so what did we do on the parallel tempering? So, uh, here is a more uh, proper formalization. So again, we are in the framework of version inversion. So we are looking at this uh, um, posterior distribution um, that is the product of the prior and this uh, likelihood function. Um, and uh, the idea here is to take this likelihood function to some uh, power uh, that is uh, possibly larger than one. So if I take to the power one, I have the true uh, posterior distribution, the true likelihood and the true posterior. But if I start rising this, um, uh, sorry, uh, power smaller than one. <laughs> if I start rising to uh, power smaller, uh, closer and closer to zero, this uh, uh, becomes flattened and flattened. This goes close to one. So essentially for T equal infinity, this posterior here is equal to the prior. And I show that the prior is a nice uh, uh, distribution work to sample from. Uh, so the idea is to introduce a sequence of temperatures that are higher and higher. T equal one is the tar target temperature and uh, the higher temperature I used uh, to make this widening of the posterior distribution. So I avoid that it concentrates too much in certain regions. Um, and uh, so this is the idea of tempering. Now the idea of parallel tempering is that now you run parallel chains with all those temperatures, okay? Uh, so now your state becomes uh, a state vector, capital theta, theta one, theta two, up to theta L. Those are the parallel chains that I'm running at different temperatures at the same time. Um, and uh, each one of the chain will uh, target the corresponding posterior distribution. So I have uh, this joint chain, joint state will have uh, uh, this joint uh, density, which is a product uh, of the posteriors uh, at the different temperatures, okay? Uh, but of course, if you just run the uh, parallel uh, uh, chains without interactions, you don't gain anything. So you, at some point you want them to interact. Uh, and the idea of the parallel tempering is that from time to time uh, at certain uh, steps, so you advance the chains independently for a few steps. Uh, and then every once in a while, you swap states between the chains. And so you say, okay, the state of the high temperature, I assign it to the chains that was running at low temperature and, and vice versa. So again, you have two chains here, the red and the, and the blue. And at some point you swap the two states. So the blue one continues here and the red one continues here. Um, and uh, so what's, uh, what's the idea is that, uh, okay, if my posterior is the blue one, which is uh, highly concentrated, when I widen it, uh, when I increase the temperature, this becomes uh, wider. So the uh, green uh, chain will, can jump much easier from one mode to the, to the other mode. Uh, whereas the blue chain might get stuck in, in one mode and never be able to jump to the uh, other mode. So if at some point I swap the states, maybe the green one has uh, gone to the other mode and then I assign it to the low temperature one and then the low temperature by magic <laughs> ends up in the other mode. Okay, so that's the idea. So here again, is uh, some graphical. Uh, so the, the purple chain here is trapped in this mode. The, orange chain can uh, move much wider. And then when I swap, uh, I, I might have some chance that the purple chain now visits also the, the other mode. Uh, of course, the question is uh, uh, how to, uh, wh when should we swap those states? So is there a good rule to decide when to swap? And uh, also how to swap if I have multiple chains, I have many possibilities to swap uh, states between the chains. Uh, so this is what we have to look at and actually we took inspiration by a paper by uh, Paul Dupuy and, and a co-author where we were trying to propose, or we actually proposed uh, a time continuous version of this parallel uh, tempering. 
um, where uh, actually uh, you're forced to decide how to, to, to swap in a time continuous uh, uh, limit. So they came up with this idea of an uh, infinite uh, uh, swapping limit for parallel tempering, which I think is a very nice paper. Uh, so we revisited this idea in the context of, uh, of Markov chains where we have discrete uh, steps. So we are not in a time continuous uh, setting. Uh, and actually, uh, this leads to two uh, possible algorithms that I name uh, unweighted and uh, weighted uh, uh, parallel tempering, which I'm going to describe uh, uh, right now. So this uh, uh, this work was, is uh, with uh, Juan Pablo Ra Raul and also in collaboration with Jonas uh, Lotz, who was visiting a PFL for a few months. Um, so here is the general setting for this uh, generalized parallel tempering. Uh, so first, uh, uh, let's consider all possible swapping. So let's consider all possible permutation of, of the states. So let's not limit to some a priori defined uh, swapping rules. Um, of course, if we consider the whole possible permutations, so it's going to be L factorials. If we have L temperatures, so if you take many temperatures, this might be uh, constraining. So you might also want to consider a subset of permutations, uh, but there is guarantee reversibility of the of this uh, chain is that if you have a permutation in your set, you want to have also the inverse permutation in the same set. So then you make sure that you can also come back to the original state. Um, so this, uh, okay, this is just for notation. Uh, if sigma is a permutation, I denote by theta sigma the permuted uh, state once I apply this permutation. Uh, and then, uh, so the first ingredient is to select which permutations, which could be the whole possible set of permutations or a subset that satisfies this rule. And the second ingredient that we need uh, is the probability of choosing one permutation. And this probability may depend on the current state uh, theta. So I define a swapping ratio here, R theta sigma, which is a probability of drawing sigma, knowing that we are in the state theta. And then the uh, mechanism works uh, uh, in the following way. So we, the, the, the parallel chains have advanced up to a, a given uh, state theta. Then I draw a permutation, I permute the states, uh, and then I run again the metropolis asking uh, uh, test uh, to decide whether to accept this permuted state or not. Okay, uh, so, and this will look like this. So this is the metropolis asking done on this swapping mechanism. Okay, uh, and uh, it looks exactly uh, as uh, the standard one. So what I have to check uh, is the ratio between the density in the permuted state versus the density in the original state and decide whether this move is uh, good or bad. Uh, but uh, since in general, this mechanism is not uh, symmetric. So I have also to take this ratio of the proposal uh, of going from theta to the permuted state or for the permuted state to the original state. So I have to take into account this ratio here between the swap, swapping rates. Um, and um, uh, since this is a metropolis asking mechanism, uh, this will preserve the uh, this joint uh, distribution. Okay, so when you run this chain with this mechanism and with this uh, uh, test here, the whole uh, coupled uh, parallel chains will have this pi y as invariant distribution, where pi y, I recall, is the product of the, uh, okay, I should not go that far back. So it's the product of the uh, tempered versions of the density. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a general uh, framework, uh, general, um, parallel tempering algorithm. Of course, the question is what should we choose for this uh, swapping ratio? And there is actually a very simple and nice uh, choice. And this, essentially that was, was proposed in this paper by Dupuy uh, and, and co-authors in this infinite limit. Uh, and the, this is a particularly nice choice. So let's choose this uh, swapping ratio proportional to directly to the uh, dense, joint density of the swap state, okay? And then of course you have to normalize so that this is a probability mass function. So if you go with this choice, it's particularly nice because uh, you end up with an acceptance which is equal to one. 
one line calculation to see if you plug this uh, uh, swapping ratio into the metropolis asking acceptance uh, rejection criterion, this is always equal to one. So you end up always accepting. So then the idea is that you just do this uh, proposal every iteration of your joint Markov chain, uh, and you do this test here, and essentially you propose every step with this uh, uh, state-dependent uh, swapping rate. Um, so I call this uh, uh, swapping kernel Q. So this is the one that performs the swapping plus the test, the metropolis testing test, what I call uh, P, uh, I think it was in some previous slides. Uh, so I call P here is just the step where you do, you advance uh, each chain with uh, whatever transition kernel, uh, your favorite transition kernel to advance the chains and you perform the metropolis testing uh, for, for the chain. So both P and Q are kernels uh, that have uh, the, this joint invariant, joint uh, density as an invariant measure, as an invariant density. Uh, and uh, if I uh, use this palindromic structure, then I make sure that they are also reversible. So if uh, P is reversible, this Q is also reversible because I guarantee that they can always do the inverse uh, swap. Uh, and then uh, um, the whole uh, Markov chain will be reversible. So this is the, the, the algorithm. Essentially, you start from initial state, you perform a, a swap and you test with metropolis testing. Then you advance uh, each chain from this uh, new uh, swap at state. Uh, and then you do another swap and this uh, will be your final update. Uh, so this was the first uh, uh, idea. This is what we call the uh, unweighted generalized parallel tempering. Uh, there is actually another idea that uh, uh, one could uh, look at. So in this idea of the uh, unweighted, uh, we are swapping the states between the chains. So we are assigning the uh, high temperature state to the low temperature, temperature chain and vice versa. But we could also think uh, a, a different way. And this was actually the proposal in this paper uh, when you want to go to this infinite limit, uh, not to change the states, but to change the temperature. They say, okay, I advance my chains. So they have the chain at temperature one. And at some point, I decide that this chain continues with temperature two uh, or with temperature five and so on, and similar for the other chains, um, which, now it makes sense if you go to, to this uh, continuous uh, limit instead of swapping the, the states. Um, so uh, if you try to do this, uh, uh, now we have to introduce uh, different kernels. Uh, so I still have these uh, permutations, sigma, uh, but then uh, I introduce, so what happens when I decide to do something uh, it happens that up to here, I have advanced my chains with the original uh, kernel P, uh, but at, at this point here, I swap the temperature. So I change the kernel with which I advance the chains. So instead of the original P, I start using this P sigma, where the first chain now has the temperature sigma of one, so the permuted temperature, and the second and the third one is et cetera, okay? Um, um, now, the and and then of course you have to decide uh, how to choose these permutations, uh, and the rule uh, it would be similar as before. So we have uh, we assign this weight or this probability of a permutation, which again is proportional. I mean it's not exactly the same as before. Um, so let me come back to this point. Um, so if you do this. Uh, and you randomly permute the temperature, uh, then you should not expect this chain to go to this, uh, um, to the same limit uh, uh, distribution as before, because now essentially each chain is visiting all temperature at the same time. So I cannot claim anymore that the first chain is associated to temperature one, the second to temperature two, and the, and the last to temperature L. Uh, so with this mechanism, you, you converge to a limit distribution that is not the right one or the previous one, and is a symmetrized version where you take all permutations of, of uh, um, 
uh, states. So uh, um, I'm skipping the slides, sorry. Um, essentially, uh, you end up with this uh, invariant distribution where you take uh, the original joint distribution, you swap it in all possible ways, and then you average, uh, you take a combination of all these swap uh, joint distributions. Um, so if I call pi sigma the distribution where I have swapped the, the temperature, uh, the uh, mechanism uh, for, for this algorithm now is to introduce these weights, again, proportional to the uh, um, density on the current state theta, but with the temperature swapped. So the difference with respect to the previous one is that before I was taking the joint density in the swapped state, and now I have the, the state is not swapped, but what is swapped is the temperature in the joint density. Okay. Um, so I have these weights here. Now the algorithm looks slightly different now uh, because I don't really perform a swap. I just uh, uh, change a kernel. So one way of interpreting is that is that building a kernel that is a combination of this, all these kernels with all, all possible permutations of the temperature, each one weighted with this weight here, that sum up to one. So now you see this kernel as a combination, uh, as a mixture of kernels. And then the algorithm of what it does is that at each step it draws the permutation and then it applies it draws a permutation according to this probability mass function, and then it applies the corresponding kernel with the swap at uh, temperatures. Okay, uh, so you somehow it's simplified. Uh, you just uh, start from the initial state, you draw a permutation, and then in the next step, you apply the kernel with the permitted temperatures. Um, okay, as I said, uh, this doesn't go to the uh, correct uh, invariant distribution. So if those are two temperatures. Uh, what you should imagine here is that uh, for in, in this direction, horizontal direction, my density is highly localized in those two modes. In the vertical direction, I have tempered this density, so it becomes flatter. There is a channel between those two modes. Um, when I symmetrize in this way, this uh, symmetrized uh, joint density becomes this one. Okay, so it's invariant by the permutation of the states now because of this construction. So this means that uh, if I want to use this mechanism to compute my posterior expectation, I have to do important sampling because I'm not uh, converging to the right distribution anymore. Uh, and uh, But this is can be done quite easily. So suppose that my quantity I want to compute uh, is actually a function of the state at the correct temperature. Okay, so I should compute uh, this with respect to the correct invariant distribution. But this I consider uh, as an expectation with respect to this joint distribution, not the symmetrized the joint one, of something that depends only on the last uh, temperature, fine. Uh, then I do my important sampling. So now I, I uh, compute the expectation with respect to the symmetrized density uh, of this uh, plus the likelihood ratio. Uh, but now I realize that this quantity here uh, is uh, actually equal uh, if I permute uh, the, the states. Okay, so th this one I can also compute it by looking at uh, the permuted uh, state sigma L. And the, I mean, somehow all these quantities invariant by permutations of, uh, uh, of the states and by construction. So I can actually average. Uh, or sum up all these quantities for all possible permutations and divide by the number of permutations. Uh, and then uh, each one of these, uh, and then I'm running a Markov chain that is targeting this symmetrized uh, measure. So this will be the final uh, estimator that I use. Uh, I could stick to this one, uh, but actually the idea is that uh, I should also use information from the other chains because they are all identical at this point. So why restricting to information only on the final on the chain at level L I should profit of all the, uh, all the chains in, in building the estimator. Um, okay, some uh, um, 
Okay, so some little analysis that we have uh, done was essentially was a check that uh, everything is, is working in this construction. So if you assume that the kernel, each kernel for each chain, the original kernel that you use to advance the chain is, uh, is reversible and is uh, geometrically ergodic, uh, then uh, essentially, we, so we, we needed uh, another assumption here is a more technical assumption that uh, if we take this joint density and we permute with two different permutations, so this uh, they overlap because if they don't, then uh, uh, you run into problems. Uh, but uh, so under this uh, um, extra technical assumption, we could show that both the unweighted and the weighted lead to reversible chains. Uh, and they are both geometrically ergodic. So they both will converge to the corresponding uh, invariant distribution. Uh, so this is the good uh, uh, result, uh, the highly suboptimal result that we have uh, obtained uh, is that uh, in this proof here, we prove that they are geometrically ergodic, but if we, if we look at the rate at which they converge, uh, actually the only thing that we could say is that it converge at, at, at a, um, essentially uh, at the worst rate among the original chains. So we didn't go deep into trying to prove that actually the convergence should be much faster than uh, the, the slowest chain in, in, the, in the list of chains. But if you want to, to quantify the, uh, how much you improve the, the mixing of, of the chains, then it's a much more uh, involved argument because then you start look look at the structure of the of the posterior distribution and understand how much by tempering you uh, power the jump from one mode to another. So it would be a much more, I mean, still to be done. <laughs> um, okay, so in practice, it works much better than just uh, the, the slowest chain. Um, okay, here is an example for the uh, wave inversion. Um, so here is not the elastodynamics, so this is just acoustic, so scalar wave uh, uh, equation uh, with uh, two uh, parameters, theta three, theta four, that are the density and the material properties. Uh, and uh, the, the forcing term uh, uh, simulates a point source, so it's a concentrated Gaussian uh, in a location theta one, theta two. Uh, with some dependence in times that is localized around time zero. So we should simulate a sort of an earthquake. Um, so the parameters we are trying to invert are these four parameters, the position of the source, theta one, theta two, and the two material properties, theta three, theta four. Um, and uh, we used uh, here, I mean, we generated the observations on three locations on the surface at 117 times. Um, and uh, with uh, some no Gaussian noise on each observation, so around 2% noise. Um, so the, uh, this is how the posterior look like. Uh, and what I show here is a posterior on theta one, theta two, that is the location of the source for different values of theta three, theta four. So those are slices of the posterior. Uh, and you see that it has a very complicated structure in this type of uh, uh, seismic problems. So it's, uh, the, the source is rather localized, but when you change the material properties, the position changes. So it's likely a tube uh, of a high mode in, in this uh, plane, theta one, theta two. Uh, so this is a snapshot of results. Uh, so we have compared this uh, generalized parallel tempering with, uh, okay, the reference that we have used is uh, just a random walk metropolis. So we move by Gaussian moves uh, with the metropolis asking acceptance rejection. Uh, the standard parallel tempering is where you swap sequentially one to two, two to three, three to four and do a sweep uh, of this type, or you just take one couple and you swap randomly. Um, and, uh, and then we have compared those two generalized uh, parallel tempering uh, uh, approaches that we have uh, investigated. And the last one was uh, somehow competing another uh, work who proposed a state dependent swapping uh, rate, uh, but different than the one that we have analyzed. Um, so here, 
I'm showing the uh, the variance of the estimator when computing the mean of uh, theta one and theta two. I think it was written somewhere. I forgot one. Um, and uh, relative to the variance of the estimator that you obtain with a simple random walk metropolis. And you see that when you do the tempering, you actually uh, reduce the variance very significantly by this tempering technique. And actually this generalized version does perform uh, better, does improve with respect to the standard uh, uh, parallel tempering. Um, okay, so this was, I think, a nice uh, idea to explore. Of course, there are many questions that are left uh, open, uh, starting from uh, in the theoretical point of view to improve this uh, characterization of the, of the mixing of, of the tempering. Uh, and uh, from the more practical point of view, I think the question that is still open is how to choose, uh, how many temperature to, to choose and which temperature to choose is still somehow open for discussion. Um, okay, so we should probably speed up uh, and go to the second, how much? Okay, um, so go to the uh, next part that is a multi-level uh, uh, MCMC. So here now the idea is to uh, exploit uh, not the temperate versions of the uh, posterior distribution, but uh, um, approximations that uh, different versions that come from cheaper approximations of the forward model. So as I showed uh, earlier, uh, the target one is this one, but we want to exploit also uh, posteriors that are obtained thereby running cheaper uh, forward source. And the general idea is the one of multi-level uh, Monte Carlo. So we want to compute the expectation at level uh, capital L, that's our target accuracy. And we write this expectation as a telescopic sum. Uh, notice that L appears twice, appears in the evaluation of QL, if you approximate the quantity in a certain grid, but that uh, appears also in the, in the density here. Okay, so when you telescope, you have this double uh, index appear. Um, and then you write the, in the telescopic sum, uh, and then you want to somehow estimate independently each one of those differences with the idea that the differences become smaller and smaller when you are close to, when you go to fine levels. Um, now, as I said, there are uh, several uh, ideas around, uh, and AJ is, is an expert on this, on how to uh, approximate in a clever way these differences so that the variance of the estimator is uh, small and gets smaller and smaller when you go to final uh, levels. So what we have explored is, uh, is the idea that was proposed in the paper by Dodwell, uh, Schaeckel and Peckentrup uh, that is summarized in this estimator here. Uh, so essentially we run Markov chain Monte Carlo for each one of those terms uh, and we build an ergodic estimator. Now, if you do it uh, very naively, it will not work uh, because, of course, this difference is small. Uh, you want the variance of the estimator for this difference to, to be small. So you need uh, that the chains that you use to compute those two expectations stay uh, highly correlated, not only highly correlated, stay close by uh, so that uh, the variance of the estimator will uh, Get smaller and smaller. Uh, so in in this construction for this estimator, the whole game is to build a couple chains. Uh, notice the double index now. Uh, so the first index L refers to the level in this sum here. Uh, the second index refers to the fact that this chain here is targeting this marginal. So the posterior distribution at level L. So computed with the discretization little l, whereas this chain here is targeting a slightly different uh, posterior at level l minus one. Okay, but I want those two chains to run in parallel and to stay highly correlated. Um, so here is another pictorial uh, description of the algorithm. So we are running many uh, chains. We start with uh, the chain at level zero, so the coarsest level. This sh hopefully should be relatively inexpensive. 
uh, and this will estimate the first term here in this telescopic sum. Uh, and then once we have run this chain, hopefully we have uh, gained some idea and some information on the posterior. Uh, and then uh, we can start running this next level. So the next level will be the level one, where we are running two chains that target the posterior zero and the posterior one. Those two chains run in parallel, but hopefully they are sufficiently correlated so that the variance of the estimator is smaller than here. So we can run for a shorter time, but also maybe we have gained some information here from this sampling, which allows us to build a better Markov chain here that mixes faster. So it has a shorter Bernin and mixes faster so we can gain. Uh, and then we have run this uh, and they have gained even more information and then we can come to the next level. So uh, at w the farther we go, the shorter will be this change that we have to run. Um, so how to do this? Uh, well, uh, first uh, idea, or actually the idea that we have looked at is the idea of using independent samplers, uh, which essentially is the same idea that was proposed uh, uh, in this paper or, or the visitation of the construction that was proposed uh, in, in this paper here. Uh, and uh, here is uh, how it works. Uh, so if we want to generate those two chains at level uh, L and L minus one, those two couple chains, uh, we choose a proposal and we actually choose a proposal that is independent on the current state. So that's what is called the independent uh, uh, sampler. Um, but this proposal may and actually should depend on, on the level L. So we should, there should be some work in building a good proposal. Uh, what do we do with this proposal? Well, the idea is that we generate uh, a candidate from this proposal, and then we propose the same candidate to both chains, okay? Uh, and then we run uh, the Metropolis asking uh, acceptance rejection on the two chains uh, separately separately but not necessarily independently because you can also use the same uniform random variable to do the test if you add some extra coupling actually this was an idea that you had proposed also in some uh, of your papers um so this is uh, the final uh, algorithm so if we want to advance from i to i plus one we generate a candidate z and then each of the two chains runs the metropolis asking uh, algorithm so by this mechanism, it should be quite obvious that each chain is targeting the, the correct marginal, because uh, if you just look at one chain, it looks like a uh, metropolis hosting with independent sampler. Uh, the coupling comes from the fact that they are proposing the same state to, to both. Uh, and uh, why should this achieve the goal? Well, the rationale is that uh, the farther you go in the, in the levels, the more those two posteriors should look alike. So the game should be to try to build an independent proposals that looks similar to this pi L and pi L minus one. Of course, of course, levels might be difficult, but when you go to finer level, you should try to build something that is close to this one. Um, and then uh, since uh, if pi L is close to both, uh, so sorry, if PL is close to both pi L and pi L minus one, when you do this test here, uh, it should get a high probability of acceptance, right? Because this term should be nearly one, this ratio should also be nearly one. And this means that there is a higher and higher chance when you go deeper in the levels that both chains will accept the proposed state. And if both chains accept the proposed state, we say that the two chains are synchronized, so they go together. Uh, and in that case, this difference here will be very small because the, this is QL minus QL minus one evaluated on the same state. So here you see the discretization in the quantity of interest and this goes to zero, okay? Uh, so essentially whenever the two chains accept, that's good. I mean, the difference is small. If one of the two chains reject or both chains reject, then the chains are desynchronized and then this, this, this difference can be arbitrarily large because we're evaluating the two quantities on states that do not have anything to do with each other, but you hope that this happens with very small probability. So at the end, you get something that is small. Okay, that's the idea, core idea of the algorithm. 
Um, so how to choose a proposal distribution? Well, there is a first very naive uh, idea is just to use the prior, but this will in general be very inefficient. Uh, as I said, you rather would like to build a proposal that depends on uh, the level L and try to learn uh, the distribution. Um, so then the, the other idea is try to use the information that you collect uh, uh, on the way. So if I go back to this picture, the idea would be to start running the chain. So running the chain at level zero, you learn somehow the distribution at level zero, and then using this information, you try to build an independent proposal for this couple of chains. Now you run this, now you have more, even more information on the distribution at level zero and level one, and then you try to use this to come up with a better independent proposal for the next level. Uh, so how to do this in practice? Well, the, we have tried a couple of things and there is surely space to, to try many more. Uh, so one simple idea is just to do a kernel density estimation based on the samples that you have collected at the previous uh, level, or you could draw, just try to use a Gaussian distribution fitted on again on the samples that you have collected on the previous level. But it, as I said, there is surely space to be imaginative and using some generative models or optimal transport or uh, normalizing flows. So once you have learned the distribution, you try to extrapolate what's the next distribution. So uh, just to mention in the original paper by Schaeckel and then Gother, uh, what they were doing is just subsampling from the previous uh, chain. Okay, it's a purely subsampling strategy, which uh, might have drawbacks in the sense that uh, if you only do subsampling, you will never explore new uh, states from, from one level to another. So if your distribution at level zero is quite far from the distribution at level L, this algorithm will not work. You need some either randomization or so. Uh, okay. Some uh, pieces of uh, analysis, so what we could choose, since we are in the setting of an independent sampler, uh, I mean, it's not too difficult to analyze things. Uh, so what uh, we could show is that, uh, I mean, you usually, usually need this condition that uh, the uh, proposal dominates the uh, target. So what we need is that the, ra the ratio between the proposal PL and the target either at level L or at level L minus one is lower bounded by some constant between zero and one. This guarantees that the independent sampler on both on each chain separately converges. Now we still want to show that uh, the coupled chain actually converges and has an invariant distribution. This is more complicated because you have this mechanism that uh, both chains can accept or both chains can reject or one accept and one reject. So uh, it's a little bit more involved, but, but we could show that uh, uh, if we have this condition uh, and we need some moment, uh, uh, some bounded moments on the density, proposal density PL, uh, then this couple chains actually has invariant joint measure that they call mu L, so is ergodic. Um, and uh, and then uh, this uh, ergodic estimator will converge to this right difference. Uh, and uh, the variance of this uh, estimator for the couple chain uh, scales like uh, this VL, which is the variance with respect to this uh, limit joint measure of the couple chains of this difference. And this joint measure by the mechanism that I've described is highly concentrated on the diagonal because you have a high chance that both chains accept the, the same state. So this joint measure here is not a density, it only has an atom, a strong mass on the diagonal plus some uh, um, density outside of the diagonal. So this is a quantity actually that governs somehow the quality of the um, Markov chain Monte Carlo construction. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that we, we, with this, if we make assumptions on uh, how the forward model is approximated with respect to the discretization parameter, also what are the rates of convergence on the, on the forward model and on the quantity of interest, we could uh, uh, actually quantify the gain when you apply this multi-level Monte Carlo uh, strategy. So essentially, we assume that we have some weak uh, uh, rate of convergence here some uh, convergence in the approximation of the state. And then we can show that uh, this variance here 
decays at a certain rate beta, and this beta depends uh, on quite a few things, depends on this rate of strong approximation of the forward model, uh, and depends on the rate at which you approximate the quantity of interest. Uh, it involves also some moments uh, uh, assumptions on the quantity of interest, but if, the, if QL has infinite moment, essentially you get uh, the smallest between those two rates. Um, okay, so this, uh, I don't give the details, but essentially you recover the more or less standard uh, results for uh, multi-level Monte Carlo uh, for, for this type of algorithm. Um, okay, just an example and I conclude. So this was uh, on a simply elliptic problem with a, a random uh, uh, profit test case with four uh, parameters. Uh, the observations were uh, observation of the solution U in uh, many uh, in a grid uh, nine by nine points polluted by some Gaussian noise. Uh, and the quantity of interest we were looking at was just the integral of the solution of, uh, over the domain. And in this case, we have uh, looked at as a proposal, a, a mixture between the prior and the kernel density estimation based on the previous uh, samples. Um, and uh, what, is, what I show here are scatter plots of the quantity of interest evaluated at, on the samples at level zero and one, one and two, two and three. And you see that uh, these concentrate more and more on the di diagonal. So there are many more and more samples where those two quantities are equal. And this shows that the this joint density has a mass on the diagonal. Um, and uh, if you look at the autocorrelation function of the different couple chains, you see that this also improves when you go deeper in the levels. So those chains mixes, mix faster and faster because uh, you use a better and better proposal for when you go deeper in the levels. Um, and um, yeah, we check at the convergence, so the rate uh, at which these variances uh, decay, uh, and this uh, look nice. So we got slope two, which is essentially what we were expecting, um, and uh, considerable improvement in complexity of the multi-level construction versus the simple single level one. Uh, I think I'm. Out of, yeah, you've got a couple yeah. of minutes, but not okay. Uh, I just mentioned this is somehow work in progress. I mean, he's in uh, Juan Pablo's thesis. I don't know if we will ever publish it, but <laughs> uh, of course, there are other ideas. I mentioned a few ideas uh, uh, on how to generate the proposal by independent sampler, but one could also look uh, at proposals that are state dependent, so not going away from this pure independent sampler. And one nice idea, but of course, you need this coupling. So, one nice idea is using this concept of maximal uh, coupling. So suppose that you do a random walk uh, metropolis on the two chains. So you just move with a Gaussian move um, around the current state. If you want to couple the two chains, uh, you should couple those two Gaussians. Okay, so you should create a coupling of the two Gaussians that has a, has a large marginal that uh, achieves the maximal uh, coupling. So there is a quantification of this idea of maximal coupling that is uh, uh, a, a joint measure uh, that has marginals R and Q is a maximal coupling in the, uh, in, with respect to the TV distance uh, if it satisfies this property. So if you draw a random variable ZW according to this joint distribution, which will have the right marginals, uh, this joint gamma is a maximal coupling if the TV distance of uh, between R and Q of the marginals is exactly equal to the probability that those two uh, random variables disagree, okay? So essentially, again, you have a notion of you try to get those two variables as equal as possible. Um, so we have uh, looked at that, this idea. So this actually comes from, I mean, the, the idea is it was there before, but I mean, it's been used in this paper by Jacob and, and, and Alves. Um, this is one way of achieving a maximal coupling between two normals, uh, where essentially you sample the first one, uh, and then for the second one, uh, in, with some probability, you just uh, do a, a shift to correct the mean, 
and uh, if it doesn't work, you uh, sample on the orthogonal. Uh, so this would be an independent sampling, and this is a maximal coupling sampling that uses this particular algorithm. So you see, this is highly degenerate uh, distribution, but has the right marginals and uh, uh, achieves. Uh, uh, in most of the cases, the two samples are equal. Okay, so we have also tried to explore these things, but this is work in progress. So I think I uh, stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fabio. Excuse me. Thank you, Fabio, for that very nice talk. Do I have questions for the speaker, please? Yeah, please. Brett's here to talk. Okay. Um, that was a very nice talk. I was interested in uh, specifically on the first half where you have the tempering approach. If I understand correctly, you have the same cost of evaluating the likelihood regardless of the temperature that you have, right? Um, yes. You're just... Um, changing the somehow the the noise uh, covariance right i wonder if it would be possible or even advantageous to also have different mesh discretizations for different temperatures uh, yes definitely uh, these ideas can be combined um I'll go to the right slide but um however uh so you can go to the weighted version. I mean, is is the same on the unweighted one? Um, so uh, suppose you consider all possible permutations. Uh, when you have uh, to evaluate this probability mass function, uh, either in the weighted or in the unweighted case, uh, in principle, you would have to uh, test all possible permitted states. And for each one of those, evaluate uh, the corresponding uh, posterior distribution for all the temperatures. So you would end up uh, with uh, L factorial estimations of likelihoods, and they are all equally costly. So that would be a huge cost, okay? But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you don't need to do this because uh, the evaluation of the likelihood is, uh, is always the same so you, you only solve the forward problem once and then you just combine the permutation. So you can bring down this cost of evaluating this probability mass function to L, not L factorial, okay? Um, so L, L, L is necessary because you have to evaluate the L temperate versions, yeah. uh, but it's linear in L. If you change the discretization now, uh, then you cannot play this trick anymore. Uh, and then you risk to see this factorial cost. Uh, so then, uh, okay, there's still ideas to be explored on how to combine things. I see, I see. To bring the cost. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, small question, how have you chosen the sequence of temperature? Uh, that's a <laughs> easier question to which I don't have an answer. <laughs> My trial and error. <laughs> I mean, typically is a geometric sequence. Uh, now, how to choose the parameter in the geometric sequence. Uh, I don't remember what was written there, uh, but how to choose the parameter is, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, I mean, this was done by, yeah, essentially, uh, if you have a rough idea on, uh, on the distribution, and say if it is a multi-model, you want that level zero is wide enough to cover, uh, to be able to jump from one mode to another. You want to inflate, uh, but this requires some knowledge on where the modes are and how far apart they are and how much you have to temper. Um, so I still don't have a good recipe for choosing the temperatures. Any further questions? No, I actually have several questions, but I'll I'll keep myself or censor myself to two. Uh, the first question is: It's been a while since I read your multi-level paper. Did you have an exact expression for the invariant measure in UL? 
so if you sorry. if you go when you did the multi-level MCMC where you did the 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 independent sampler uh, with no. this same proposal, yes. So you have a, sorry if you go back, uh, yeah. Here, so here you have a new uh, no, not this, no, not this one. Not. Um, uh, the answer is uh, no. We don't uh, have. Uh, Yeah. Uh, this yes, yes, this new oh yes, that's correct. Yes. Uh, no, we don't have an explicit expression. Uh, we know that there is a mass on the diagonal and somehow we can do some bounds on uh, um, on the density on the diagonal, but yeah. no, we it, don't it, have it. It's not the max expression. coupling. It's hmm? not it's not the max coupling of pi L and pi L minus one. It's a question. I, I, uh, I don't, it, yeah. uh, uh, it's, not, it's not obvious. So that's why I'm no, asking. I don't think it is. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the the second quick uh, as a remark actually a sort of remark. So when you talked about the, the last part about doing something for the max coupling of the proposals, uh, we have an article with Cody Law and Jeremy yeah, Heng. Yeah. Yet. So we we did something. We used the reflection coupling, the maximal coupling. So it might be, uh, you know, worth as a kind of uh, reference point. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's all we've gone over time. Thank you so much, Fabio, for another nice talk. Thank you.